I'm going to be the brown Susan Boyle, you know? Like. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something weird about the fact that, like, we're talking about your series, which is about failure, but I just spent the last 45 seconds listing all your accomplishments? I mean, this happens to me a lot. I feel like it's like the moment people hear How to Fail as a Pop Star, they're like, they have my bio with them or something. They're like, Polaris Prize, Mac Billboard. Like, it's just, you know. But I think it speaks to the ways that we we don't feel comfortable when someone says they failed. Like, it's it's awkward. It's like, and I think it's well-intentioned. I think people want to be like, no, 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 it's okay, you know? Yeah, but you don't? Well, I think what that does is it robs us the opportunity of actually just saying I'm disappointed, right? Like, I think failure is actually a really universal feeling and expression, but because we go so quickly to resilience and so quickly to being like, no, you're amazing in all these other ways, we don't actually just get to be like, oh, but I really wanted this very specific thing and it sucks. It didn't work out for me, you know? What was what was the dream when you were a kid growing up in Edmonton? I mean, it's a really good question because I feel like pop stardom in 2023, I feel like having a couple thousand followers on Instagram, yeah. being an influencer. Like, you're a, you're a pop star to a lot of <laughs> the kids. You're <laughs> goddamn right. You're, I've, often, I've often said that about myself, that I'm the pop star of public radio. <laughs> <laughs> Need to put that in your bio. But for me, like, I grew up in the 90s, so it was, like, stadiums, David Letterman, cover of Rolling Stone. Like, those were, like, check, check. Those are the markers of pop stardom, you know? Like, think Whitney Houston, think George Michael, think Madonna, you know, Janet Jackson. Why? Why did you want that? I like that you asked that because so often people think it's about being famous. Like, she wanted to be famous. She wanted to be a celebrity. And it's actually, it's not about that at all. Like, I think for me, this is going to sound really corny, but as a brown queer kid in Edmonton in the 80s and 90s, I used to, like, crank, I used to, you know, experience all kinds of homophobia on a daily basis, like relentless every single day. I'm not even exaggerating. And the way that I survived was I would come home and I would crank Fiona Apple and I would light candles and I would dance in my room. And there was something about that musical experience that was transformative. It was transcendental. And that's the gift of pop culture. That's the gift of pop music is that it takes us out of reality. And I think for me, it wasn't just a music listener I, I experience. What I wanted to do was give back. I wanted to be able to do what they did for me. And I'll never be able to give back to Fiona Apple, I'll never be able to give back to Tori Amos or Sheryl Crow or any of these artists. But my hope was that if I could do that for somebody else, then that was my way of giving back. And so I think for me, really, it's like I wanted impact. You know? I'm so curious about that because I thought and I don't know what this says about me. I thought the way you were going to end that sentence was, hey, I was a queer brown kid growing up in, in, in Edmonton, Alberta, and I, was, I experienced homophobia every single day. Every single day I got mocked. I got made fun of. You know, It was really, really hard. And I thought by being a pop star, if I made myself as big and undeniable as possible, I would be um, immune to I that I mean, that's kind of part thing. of it. That's part of it. I think being those things, being different, you're always trying to figure out how to be loved, how to be accepted, how to be safe. And seeing Michael Stipe on the cover of Rolling Stone, you know, in 1995, talking about being fluid, I was like, okay, that is a job that I could potentially aspire to. And everyone will love me. Every No one yeah. will make fun of me. Yeah. I will be okay. So that's part of it as well. Yeah, I think I, I think I had a bit of that. Yeah. I think like my my aspirations to like I don't know what they were. This this watching this TV show made me think about that a little bit. And I think there was that. I think I got I got picked on a little bit and I thought, well, maybe if I got big. Who do you want to be? Who are your people? David Letterman and Conan O'Brien. <laughs> right. <laughs> Same people you you wanted to be on their show. Here I am. And here we are. It all worked out. <laughs> how 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 close did you get? How close did I get? I mean, I think what's interesting about the show and like a lot of people have said this, the director of the play, the director of the TV show is like at times it feels like I got very close, you know, like my trajectory in a lot of ways follows the story that's very similar in a biopic. You have a small town kid who doesn't fit in, does some all competitions, gets a phone call from a famous rock star in the big city, moves to the big city, does the showcases, and then pff, nothing happens, right? So I think that there's like these brushes, and I think the show tries to convey that. Like, it's like, we're going up, we're going up, we're very close, very close, and then crash, you know? Like, it's just, it's not quite, just never quite lands. And I think it speaks volumes of like, actually, how difficult, like how anomalous that kind of success and that kind of reach is. 
How does what you're doing now measure up to what you want to do? Not as a kid? at all. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, again, like this is what's difficult is like I'm so thrilled to be a working artist. And I think one of the things we have to do as we age is we're constantly redefining our ideas of success. Yeah. But when I go to bed at night, I'm not like, man, I'm really glad I published 12 books. Yeah. I'm like, oh. I wish I I wish I was just even a one hit wonder. Still? still, 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 still. I mean, somebody just asked me this. They're like, "Is there a part of you that's still?" And I'm like, "I hate to say this, but yes, there's a part of me that stills." Like this show, someone's gonna watch Timbaland or like you know Pharrell is gonna see this show and be like, "That kid's got by that old lady's got pipes." <laughs> we just gotta put a beat under her, <laughs> and it's just gonna be smoking, you know. Like, but, but, but I'm gonna be the brown Susan Boyle, uh, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> the late discovery exactly. that comes up a cover of Reader's Digest. But 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 hold on, you probably already got the cover of Reader's Digest. But hold on, let me let me. Don't you? It, don't as you get older, don't you realize that that life is not enviable? I mean, when I'm <laughs> when I'm touring as a musician, yeah, yes, yeah, definitely. I'm yeah. like, you know, the nice thing about books is that like you show up at two o'clock, everyone shows up at two thirty, you're done by three o'clock. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, music it's so so hard, and the industry actually, you know, I just put out an album earlier this year, and like I haven't toured music in a few years, and I'm like. This is just as bad as it was like 10, 15 years ago. So yes, in those moments, I'm like, maybe it's okay. <laughs> but also like when you, you know, Shawn Mendes or, or, or these, these folks or, or Olivia Rodrigo, like. All my peers. But they, you, your aspirational peers. Yes, yes. They can't go to a restaurant. They can't. See, that stuff doesn't like, I'm like. You can't go to a restaurant. Like I just, I, I, I doesn't do anything for me. <laughs> I guess I understand. I feel like the, the the closer I've been to that kind of like not, not in my own personal life, but I feel like getting to meet people, thankfully through this job, who um, have that level of fame, it doesn't seem aspirational to but me. I guess for me, where I keep going back to, and like it's like I think about. I'm not obsessed with legacy. I'm not like, oh, what are people going to remember me? My like, I, I, I do not have that kind of. Uh, attachment to this body, to this life. But what I would love, I would love at some point in my life to write a song, to write a song that like people more than, you know, my 15 followers on Spotify, <laughs> like feel in the way that I felt everybody hurts by REM, that feel the way that I felt when I heard I Have Nothing by Whitney Houston. Like mm. that, that, it's so like the restaurants and all that stuff, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, like sympathy, boo-hoo. But like if you got to make a song and it reached people in that way and it changed their life in that way, like that's the thing I want more than anything in the world, you know? Who who played you in this in the show? Um, so there's four Vivix. Nobody asked for four Vivix, but <laughs> <laughs> I played two. Yeah. And there's uh Krista Silva plays Teen Vivic and Adrian Pavone plays uh, adult Vivek, and then I play present day Vivek and dream Vivek. Does um, having someone else play young you make you look differently at your own story? I think one of the big takeaways watching actors play me, like it's such a strange experience because you have people not only saying lines you've written, but also lines that you have sort of said then to your TV mom who is playing versions of your, like it's very weird. You're watching your life yeah. play out in front of you exactly. through actors. Exactly, yeah. but I think what it did was it I actually, I think one of the hardest things about dreams and the pursuit of dreams are not the things that you didn't have in your control, but the things that you did have in your control where you're just like, man, if I only auditioned for Canadian Idol, like if I wasn't so snobby about that, like what could have my life been? And watching Adrian and Chris, I felt a deep sense of like empathy and actually pride. I'm like, you know what? Like you didn't do all the things, but you still, you did some hard things. You, I, I don't think you even knew how much the odds were stacked against you and you still kind of went for it. And like you moved to Toronto when you knew literally no one, you know, you were in the midst of Mississauga with some like wild human being, like, you know, like you, you really pushed yourself. And so I think that was one of the many gifts that like watching actors play me did is it, it allowed me to give myself, give myself a little leniency. Give yourself a little compassion. Yeah, like being exactly. able to, to Being able to look, you're probably a little bit hard on yourself about not getting that. Always. You know, um, I think people who are in our lines of work are hard on ourselves. Yes. And it sounds like being able to watch 
an actor play you and deal with those decisions. It allowed you to offer yourself a little bit of compassion. You said that better than I did. Well, yeah, I'm very affordable. <laughs> I can come. I can come along in your. You're going to play the fifth Vivek in the what, sequel. What? <laughs> <laughs> White Vivek. <laughs> in a strange turn of events, <laughs> change his name. <laughs> Dave. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Susan. Vivek, one desperate <laughs> attempt is Vivek decides to be white. <laughs> to become a white guy with a beard. What? What about? Um, what about? Because this this show started as a a, a one woman show. What about the experience of, of sharing this with having other castmates, having other people involved? What was that experience like? It was it was such a relief, to be honest. Um, I just watched. Have you watched M- Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? Yeah, I, I, I don't watch much, but I have watched them. Yeah, Marvelous so Mrs. there's Maisel. this scene. Sorry, I'm not saying it right, but there's a scene where it's Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. That's right. Yeah, is it? Did I say yeah, right? Marvelous okay. Mrs. Maisel. Okay, I don't want to get you know canceled. Edited, canceled. By exactly. big Maisel. Exactly. Maisel heads. <laughs> by one of the Maisels. <laughs> yeah. But there's a scene where Jane Lynch is doing her first Broadway play, her her character, and she just kind of freezes and kind of like disassociates and goes back into her old comedy routine. And I remember I couldn't even watch that scene because it reminded me of there were so many times when I was doing the play and it's like a 70 minute show. It's just me on stage. There's sometimes five people in the audience and sometimes there's 300 people in the audience and it's just me. And I'm going on stage and doing something incredibly vulnerable, not just being an actor, but I'm going in front of people and saying I failed. It's a deeply humiliating thing to do. And there were so many times I was worried that I would just disassociate completely. And so having actors show up and play all these other characters in a lot of ways allowed the story to be beyond me yeah. and relieve the pressure of me to tell the story. And it in some ways was a lot more joyful. Like I enjoyed doing the play. There was a lot of joy to it. It's meant to be funny. But in some ways I was able to enjoy the story more and find the, the humor more by it not being just me. In terms of why you failed, this is a weird thing to say. I'm just realizing that I've never really talked to anyone about why they failed before. But in terms of why why you failed, there's a scene in the in the series where present day Vivek, who is you, Vivek three, Moi, Vivek three, Vivek three, you're catching, is um. <laughs> sitting <laughs> sitting at home surrounded by post its on the wall, and each one lists a reason that the, that they didn't come true. One is that I'm not related to everyone famous. Another is I don't do drugs. Um, and then there was one that just said I'm brown. So how much do you think race or racism played a part in, and I have a follow-up to this, but how much do you think race or racism played a part in, 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 the, in the failure? I definitely think a big part of what I was up against was systemic racism. I, I, do you see anyone else who looks like me in the past 20 years on that level? Yeah. You know, like the only person I can think of, and this isn't to say she's the only one, but on like pop star level was MIA. Yeah. And that moved very quickly when you think about like her career and her trajectory. And so, yeah, I, th- I think that like race and racism was a, was a big part of my failure, but I don't think it's the only one. Do reason. you, do you think, so the, the follow-up I wanted to ask to that is just about like the, did it make you reflect on the changing nature of, of the industry? And I want to be cautious about how I say this. So, you know, l- let's just say, let's just take, for example, someone like, like AP Dillon, you know, uh, a Punjabi Canadian, um, and is the biggest star in the entire world right now, especially coming out of Canada, and did it outside of the Canadian music industry. So you know, shocking. Well, exactly. And, <laughs> and the indi- tale is old as time. <laughs> well, the and, and you look at someone like Drake, who just eschewed the the Junos altogether. More and more people are coming on on our show that we're finding about, you know, because they're blowing up on TikTok. They're blowing up on and 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 these are, you know, historically marginal people from historically marginalized communities the industry that you're talking about in this that that turned you down doesn't have that same power anymore did making this show make you think differently about it was just a matter of like it was a matter of time 100 percent. maybe had it happened now things would have been different for you 100 percent. actually to go back to the list the first thing i think on the list is i was born in edmonton and the second thing was i was born in 1981 so one of the things i thought a lot about in the process of making this show and being in the pop star world is like what it means to be a product of my time. And that's something I actually cannot change. I, you know, I'm not saying that the industry has gotten significantly better. (laughs) There's all kinds of systemic issues still in the music industry. But I do look at the opportunities that young, queer, trans, BIPOC artists have. And it's like, I mean, even this show, this show could not have been made 
in like 1995. Like I look at young Vivek who plays me and it was very strange to be like, you are, you're 14 years old and this yeah. is one of your first roles. I could not have played this role. This show wouldn't have existed when I was 14, right? So I, I do think, and that's one of the things that I feel really sad about. Like I, I don't get to go back in time. I don't get to go into the future. Like I, I have to work with the variables that of, of my life essentially. That, that you, were, you were subject to a pretty cruel um, and all powerful industry. Totally. Do you, do you hope this show makes the people who watch it think differently about failure in their own lives? A hundred percent. Yeah. I really, really hope. I mean, what's so been lo so lovely, Tom, about like being able to talk about the show is like so many people will say to me, you know, actually I've never told someone this before, but I've always wanted to be a professional skier or even like Aisha who plays my mom was like, I wanted to be a dancer. Like I'm an actress, but I wanted to be a dancer. And again, it's so nice to be able to have these conversations. And again, when people say these things, it's almost like a confession. It's like this quiet moment that they're allowing themselves. And I think that the culture of celebrating success at all times and, and all of us needing to perform that is actually hurting our mental health. I think that we're constantly under the pressure of like needing to, to say yeah. I'm amazing at all times. And, yeah. and I, think, I think we need to create more spaces to talk about the rejection, the hardship, the disappointment. I think about that all the time on this show. I think, I think like sometimes I, I worry on this show that like inadvertently I'm contributing to a culture of success because, or like uh, the importance of success because everybody who comes on the show did it. Totally. So, and even when you talk about how many times they had to audition for the role, it's still in relation to, but you made it now, yeah. right? It's still about the success. I had someone on the other day and I said, what's the lesson you learned from this hard road? And, and she said, well, if you just keep going, it'll happen. And that's actually not that's true. That's actually not true. That's actually not true. And I think that that's actually really damaging. And actually, that's one of the reasons why I created that show is I, I got so tired of hearing narratives of like, if you just work hard, if you show up, if you're talented, if you know the right people, like it's actually, there are so many, some of those are factors for sure, but you put all of those together in a pot and you don't get success automatically. There are so many other factors. And for every success story, for someone who just worked hard and then it all panned out, there's thousands of us where it just didn't line up that way. And why is that important? Why is that important for us to know? Because it's a lie. It's a lie that we're being sold. And again, I, I do think that that's, that, that hurts us. Our right? self-esteem, yeah. our, our love for ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. It's um, And by offering your own story through this TV show, you can you can demonstrate that. Totally, totally. And yet at the same time, without putting a cherry on the top, my hope is that what people also take away is that it's still worth trying. Yeah. You know, like I look at that kid and I, I love that kid and I'm like, you know, if your consolation prize is getting to make a TV show about how you failed, then you win, right? So I, 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 I'm so glad that I, I never let go of music, you know?